Good morning, church. Give me a moment while I find my page. I'm so sorry. You would have thought I had this up already. But, you know, this is an awesome morning. You know, the, the birds are chirping. We have so many neighbors, and now they get to suffer through my loud voice for the next however long. Amen. Amen. You know, but this week's been awesome. Yeah. You know, it's been an amazing opportunity to just grow as a family. You know, I, I, I was able, I was privileged enough to uh, hear Courtney's uh, midweek lesson. She cut y'all up. So I don't have to. Amen. But as well, you know, on, on Thursday, we had a, a family time. As we celebrated our dear sister, Brenda, it was her ninth birthday, which is awesome. But as well, there's somebody else's birthday today. At the young age of 17 years in the faith, Ciel Pinedo's birthday is today. But you know what's interesting is, is somebody decided, man, this is a great day for me to come be baptized. Our dear friend Haley is going to make Jesus Lord of her life today. Man, it's so awesome to see somebody like Haley. I remember when I first met Haley and I was like, man, she's rare. Man, she's awesome. I remember the first time I talked to Haley, I was like, Man, I, I, I don't know how I'm going to keep up with Haley, but you know what? She's awesome. But as well, guys, this week has been amazing. We were able to play kickball on Friday. Woo! Garrett's team won, and Woo! I was lucky enough to be on Garrett's team. Yeah! But it was awesome. And today, before we get started, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Come on, bro. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we are so grateful and thankful to be here this morning. To be able to just worship you is something we never, ever want to take for granted. Lord, I pray you speak through me. You move me aside and just allow your words to come out. Lord, I love you so much. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, there was once a, a church many years ago that that was struggling it was struggling they couldn't get their members to come out to service and they're like man we need a leadership change so they called up the only person they thought could fix it and and the man on the other side of the phone said i'll come but everybody's got to be fully committed and they go we can't do that hang up the phone some time goes by they call them back, we, we need you to come. The church is dying. And he goes, I will come if everyone's fully committed. And they said, we can't do that. They hang up the phone. They call back a third time and they're like, okay, we're desperate. We'll do anything. And he says the same thing. Everybody has to be fully committed. The church decides, okay, well, well I'll let me tell you what's going to happen when you come. And he goes, okay. And they tell, the, they tell this man, they say, hey, if you come and you call everybody to full commitment, we're going to lose half of our church on the first meeting. The man goes in and he says, I, I'm willing to do that. First meeting calls everybody to full commitment. Sure enough, loses half the membership. First night. Man, as a leader, that would be something pretty daunting. Yeah. First night you pull up, half the church leaves, and you don't know what to do. Amen. But. Little do you know, later on, that church continues to grow and grow and grow. And that church of 30 went from 30 people to thousands of people. And that one church went to many churches. I am, of course, talking about the ICOC. Wow. That started in Boston, and it grew into something great. And sadly, we saw that, that church fall. And then in 2006, we see that that, that same man go and, 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 and start another church in Portland. And that church with the with the first 42 or 25 wherever you want to start 42 
now goes from 42 to over 10,000 disciples. Yeah. And that's the church that you're a part of. You're a part of a church that started so small and now is so big. But it's so interesting because it started with fundamentals. It started with people being rooted and sold out. The title of my lesson today is Fundamentally Rooted. Come on, bro. You know, two weeks ago, I was able to talk about this concept of being deeply rooted and how when something is rooted and it has deep roots, it can't be moved, it can't be shaken. But when something has these shallow roots that don't go deep, you see how easily something can be taken out. It could be a big tree like this. If it doesn't have strong roots, it will fall, it will perish. And we talked about how deep are our roots. But how deeply rooted are you to the fundamentals of being a sold out disciple? You know, to, the, to describe the word fundamental, it's simply this. In, as, an adject, as an adjective, it's forming a necessary base or core of central importance. You know, as a noun, it's a central or primary rule or principle of which something is based. The question is, is what is the base? What is the core? What is the foundation of your relationship with God? I sure hope it's Jesus, amen. In 1 Corinthians 3.11, we see that there is no foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. There can't be any other foundation. But what do you build off of that foundation? Do you build radically or do you build haphazardly? If you build something on a solid foundation and it isn't built in a way that is well, it's gonna, it's gonna stand the test of time, it will crumble in an instant. We saw that two weeks ago when we read through the, the parable of the soils. If it is not built well, if your relationship is not built well, you'll be taken out. So today, I got to ask, are you today as fired up as the day that you were baptized? Oh, good question, bro. Talk about it. Come on. Or even better, are you more fired up than the day that you were baptized? Wow. Think about it. When you're baptized, it's, you're, you're almost like an infant. <laughs> Infants are fired up about a lot of things. <laughs> but is that where your, your fire stayed? At the infant state? You know, I know CL hasn't made it 17 years with an infant fire. Yeah. The baby fire, that, that, can't, that can't be sustained. You know, if you, if, if you think about it, a really small fire can be snuffed out really quickly. But as a disciple, the question is this, are you willing to go anywhere, to do anything and to give up everything? Come on. Point number one, go anywhere. Come on. Come on, question. Question. Let's go to Acts chapter 16. And let's look at somebody who was willing to go anywhere. That is uh, our brother, Timothy. You know, I love the name Timothy. I'm a little bit up. Uh, Bias, that is my dad's name. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the name Tim. Amen. I, I have a running joke that my two favorite Bibles and my two favorite books in the Bible are first and second Timothy. But let's look at this in Acts chapter 16, verse one. It says, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived whose member, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. So he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in the area. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. 
So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. You know, Paul saw the benefits of bringing somebody like Timothy along with him. But you see that there was almost a, a barrier to en of entry for Timothy. Timothy at this point would have been beyond the age of a child. And Paul comes up to him and says, hey, I want to bring you with me. But you got to get circumcised. Whew. I remember reading that for the first time. I was like, I'm not going. I'm staying here. I'm not coming with you, Paul. I don't have that faith. Amen. And it's crazy. Because you see, Timothy's heart was, I'm willing to do anything. And I'm willing to go anywhere to advance the gospel. We see in verse 5, what was the benefit of his sacrifice? The benefit is we saw people being saved on, on a daily basis. Yeah. basis the question for us is where are you unwilling to go where are you like i will go anywhere but and now i want to tell you guys a little story when i got baptized i was 20 i was yes 21 amen i'm trying to remember how old i was 21 and I got baptized and I was like, man, I'm fired up. I'm gonna save the city I grew up in. And I remember people were being like, bro, where do you wanna go next? And I was like, I, I, I wanna go anywhere except Chicago. Wow. 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 And brothers used to come up to me and they'd be like, you better be careful, bro. You're gonna end up in Chicago. And in my youthful pride, I go, Man, God wouldn't do that to me. He knows my heart. And God looked at me and he said, I sure do know your heart. It's wicked. And so I remember I was, I was, I was uh, on staff at the church in the church in Milwaukee and I was, I was enjoying my time up there. And, and one day Jay Shelbrett comes up to me and he goes, and, 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 and I love Jay, but, but he did me dirty this day. He comes up to me before I'm going to go up and preach. And he goes, hey, bro, I got to talk to you after service. And I was like, can we talk about it now? He's like, no. So I'm just like up preaching, trying to think about what Jay needs to talk to me about. And then he's like, I'll talk to you about it right after service. Service comes. I'll talk to you about it after leaders. And I'm like, oh, hey, man. I, here I am. I thought I was in trouble. I thought I did something. I didn't know what I was doing. And sure enough, Jay sits me down. And he goes, bro, we want you to move to, uh, move to Chicago. Well. And it was interesting. Because when I uh, first became a disciple, me and I, I prayed to God. I said, God, I, 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 don't, I don't see myself volunteering for a mission team. I don't see myself volunteering to go somewhere else. But I will make a commitment to you, God, that wherever you ask me to go, I will go, no questions asked. Sure enough, God put me to the test and he said, okay, let's see, let's see how quickly you're willing to, to answer this call. Sure enough, God called me to come to Chicago and in, a, in about seven to nine days later, I was in Chicago. And it was, it was a culture shock. I was, man, I, I didn't know where I was going. I was, I was on the south side of Chicago, and everybody was like, oh, you're moving to the south side? Oh, that's scary, bro. You better be careful. And I, I had a great time on the south side. Don't, I, don't, I don't get what all the fuss is about, amen? But I was protected by God, amen? But what I learned from this is that God is going to call us all to go to places that we may not want to go. And, you know, on top of all of that, it's, it's this, too. God may never call you to go somewhere else. He may call you to build where you're at. And that might be the very thing that you despise the most. Wow. God, I want to leave. I want to go somewhere else. I want to explore the world. And God's like, no, you need to stay here and build the foundation of where you're at. You know, the question quickly becomes for us is, in our everyday life, what areas of your life are off limits to God. What areas of your life do you put God in a box? Hey, God, I'll talk about you here and I'll talk about you there, but not here, not this area. And it's very funny, it's very fitting. Sometimes we'll, we'll share everywhere else but this one area, and that's the very area that God has all the open people for you. And we're looking at God, God, I just, I'm so, I don't get it. I go and share my faith every day. 
And God's like, well, go share here. And you're like, no, not there. Are you willing to go anywhere? You know, I want to talk about two brothers that, I, that have been inspirations to me in this area, and that's Chris and Devante. You know, I remember when I first met Chris, he was like in the West. And then like two weeks later, I saw him and he was in the North. And then six days later, he was in downtown. And then he was in the, you know, Chris has been in every region, I think, except for the South, pretty much. Wow. It's, it's crazy. Wow. Come on, Chris. I was like, man, this brother sold out. He's willing to go anywhere. Wow. Nothing was going to stop Chris. And then... I was, as I was writing this lesson, I was like, man, Chris really went everywhere. And then I was thinking about it and I was like, man, the, the only brother I think that's moved more than Chris may, might be Devante. I remember I met Devante on Zoom in Chicago. And then I came down to Chicago to visit and I was like, man, it's Devante, oh my goodness. And then Devante was like, bro, you know, he's crazy, man. And, and sure enough, Devante went to Milwaukee. Then Devontae came down for a wedding and we hung out and I was like, man, bro, how long do you think you're going to be in Milwaukee? He's like, probably a couple years. Oh. Six weeks later, Devontae was in the central, the central West region. And I was like, what happened? What happened? I said, what ha I thought you were supposed to be there for two years. He goes, I know, life's crazy. And then I moved to the West and Devontae was like, I'm going to move to Kansas. And I was like, oh, I can't ever get close enough to Devontae. I felt like I, they, every single time I got close to Devonte, they moved him somewhere. Sure enough, then he is finally back in the outer, or the, the West super region with us. And we're super grateful. <laughs> These brothers are, are people to imitate. But if it's, it's so interesting, because if you read through the book of Acts, although Devonte and, 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 and Chris are awesome, they're not unique. If you look throughout the scriptures, men would travel from city to city and they didn't have the luxuries of travel that we do today. True. Man, you think it's hard to move to a different house with a U-Haul? Well. These brothers is over here like, we're gonna walk to another country with only what we have on our back. Now that is radical. Yeah. Now don't get, don't please don't mishear me. I'm not saying we got to sell all of our cars and walk everywhere. But what I am saying is we ought to consider the very fact that as disciples, this is the people we ought to imitate. We ought to have the heart like Timothy, that there's never a time that I'd be unwilling to go anywhere if it meant that I was gonna further the gospel for Jesus. Is that your heart? Or do you have a heart that is so caught up in what you're gonna lose that you miss out on the very thing and potential that God's trying to give you? Wow. Simply put, we must be willing to go anywhere. But let's go to point number two. Come on, do anything oh, bro. let's go to acts chapter eight Come on. i hope you guys like the book of acts Love it. Love it. there's a lot of great stuff in the book of acts if you haven't studied it out i deeply encourage you to i remember being in iccm and they were like yeah then there's this one thing in acts and i'm like no it's not and then i read it and i was like oh i guess it was there amen <laughs> I, I feel that a lot when i hear aj preach AJ will be like, did you guys see this nugget in this one verse? And I was like, it ain't there, bro. Who playing with me? And then AJ is like, let me show you, bro. And I'm like, amen, I'm wrong again. God loves humbling us out, doesn't he? Amen. But in Acts chapter 8, let's read in verse 26. It says, now when the angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. Verse 27 so he st started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the, uh, the, uh, of the treasury of the Con uh, Can Kandik, or Kandik, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone from Jerusalem 
to worship. You know, the first thing we see here is that Philip was willing to do anything. Yeah. And it's very interesting. The angel does not say, Philip, go to this desert road because you're going to meet a man there. And when you meet this man, you're going to baptize him. He just says, and I quote, go south to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then in the very next verse, it says this. So he started out. Now that is some faith. Yeah. Imagine your discipler came up to you and was like, hey, bro, I want you to go do this thing for me. I need you to go downtown and just stand in the middle of downtown. And that's all I'm going to tell you right now. All of us would go, but what time? Why, why do I need to be there? What should I wear? What do I need to bring? What about this? What about that? Huh? What about these things? That's our first response. What about, what about this? Right. And that's just to go downtown. <laughs> this man went on a desert road and was just like walking. But it's interesting because we, we, we see how radical Philip was, but it, almost somebody who was as radical as Philip was this eunuch. It says that this eunuch was an important official. Some of us think we're important. Some of us like to think that we have some state in the world. The Bible says that this person was important. So we know they were important. Amen. But it says that he traveled from Ethiopia all the way to Jerusalem just to worship God. Wow. Now, how many of us would be fired up if we found out that there was somebody who traveled three days just to go to church? Wow. You would be like, I got to meet this guy. I got to meet this girl. Where she's at? Where you at? I want to study the Bible with that person. But if Philip would have spent so much time wondering about why he needed to go on the road, would he have met that eunuch? He might have missed him. Spending so much time caught up in the details that he missed the very thing that God needed to use him for. In verse 28, we see this. It says, and on his way, was, he was sitting in a chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it then philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading isaiah the prophet man philip is is a radical guy he just just he he doesn't care how he looks he doesn't care what he what he has to do to help someone find jesus it says he saw him reading the book of isaiah and then the spirit said go run up to that chariot and philip was like okay and just started running man this is a radical brother. But then we get to see the payoff, so to speak. It says, do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked, this is in verse 31. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as his lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Um, <clears throat> then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And, the, and uh, then the eunuch gave the orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went into the, into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. So it's so interesting because we see something so amazing from Philip is that he was willing to do anything for God. What is your limit for God? When will you stop working for God? When will you give up? When do you decide that Hey, because you didn't answer this thing in this time, God, 
that I'm done giving you everything or I'm will, not willing to do anything for you. I'm willing to do some things, but not anything. And God, if it's not in a timely manner or if it's not something that's convenient to me, don't call me to do it. That's not radical. That's easy. Being a disciple has never been easy. You look through the book of Acts, you look through the New Testament, it was never easy to be a disciple. The standard has always been high. The expectation has always been high. But there's a benefit. There's a, there's a true benefit to went to truly finding God. There's a joy that you'll never experience anywhere else when you have a relationship, a true relationship with God. Yeah. You know, I, I really was, was very grateful that I got to hear. Uh, for, I, I felt like I got to study with Haley through Courtney. <laughs> whenever whenever I would get done talking or Haley would get done with a study, Courtney would call me and she'd be like, oh my gosh, and then this happened and then this happened and oh my gosh, uh, Haley's awesome. And I was just truly blown away by the transformation we got to see through Haley. Yeah. But that's because Haley was willing to do anything to get closer to God. You know, family, we have to be like the eunuch in our relationship with God. The eunuch made himself uncomfortable to grow with God. He stretched himself. He worked at his relationship with God until he found somebody like Philip. And sometimes I think we think that the, the that discipleship baptism was the finish line. Mm. The truth of the matter is, family, is that this is the start of the race to get to heaven. Right. And if you're not careful, you will get lulled back to sleep into complacency and before you know it you'll be right back where you started wow. you got to be willing to do anything like the eunuch let's go to acts chapter 2 verse 47 you know that the great thing i love about this is that this is very much fundamental of being a disciple is that this isn't this isn't something that that actually takes a whole lot of work to find in the Bible. It's all scattered throughout. Yeah. Yeah. But in Acts chapter two, verse forty-two, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had only the things that they cared to have in common in common. They only had some things in common. They only had the same church in common. Of course not. It says they had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising god and enjoying the favor of all the people and the lord added to their number daily those who were being saved it's interesting that the the fruit was shown at the end yeah all the all the work was shown in the front so the question for us is Today, I don't want you to ask this to anybody else, but for yourself, can you say that you're devoted to the apostles' teaching? Another way to look at this is, are you devoted to the Bible? Are you devoted to the fellowship? Are you devoted to the breaking of bread? Are you devoted to prayer? But also, it says that Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. The interesting thing is that they couldn't be filled with awe. They couldn't be filled with all these wonders and signs if they weren't there to see them. You can tell a story. It's not the same. I guarantee it. And how do I know this? Because I've heard many stories 
there's nothing quite like experiencing it. You know, you'll hear a lot of stories about great transformations in someone's life. There's nothing quite as great as seeing somebody transform right before your eyes. Man, I knew this person when they were like this, and now they're here. But as well, there's nothing quite as amazing as transforming your own life. But if you're not devoted to those first four things, don't think you're going to change. It's not going to happen overnight. And it's not going to happen if it's not consistent. You know, it's very interesting that any great anybody, the one thing that they did better than anybody else was consistency. Any great businessman, any great athlete, any great artist was consistent. You know, Courtney loves Taylor Swift. She loves her a lot, amen? And so do these sisters. But the interesting thing about her as an artist is even though I may not like her, I can't deny her success. I can't deny the fact that this, this, this woman, I'm sorry, I was gonna say this girl, this woman has made tons of money and has broke record after record after record after record. It's undeniable. She's talented. But the truth of it is, is that there's nobody as talented as Jesus. There's nobody as talented as a disciple who is just willing to give their life to Jesus and do anything for him. You can be the most successful person here on earth. And it's all going to mean nothing when you get to the heaven. And Jesus says, I never knew you. I hope one day that, you know, Taylor Swift becomes a disciple. I hope all these, these famous people become disciples. They need it. But what do we need to do to even get there? We need to be like the first century disciple. Yeah. The question is, are you willing to be devoted like this? Are you willing to serve in this way? It says that these people had everything in common. It says that they were willing to sell their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. It says that nothing was off limits for them. They said, oh, you need food? Well, let me go try to find some money to help you. Oh my goodness, what a, what a difference. What a different church this is. And after all of that, that's when they saw the explosive growth. That's when they saw people getting added to their number daily. After they did all this. You know what, family, I think we all want to see people saved. But the question for you today is, how willing are you to be like a first century disciple? How willing are you to do anything to help somebody find God. And if the, the answer is, I don't know, that's, that's okay. But it's time to reflect on what is your limit that you put in front of God. Let's go to Mark, or I'm sorry, point number three, give up everything. Let's go to Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, pick it up here in verse 17 and it says this it says as jesus started out on his way a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him good teacher he asked what must i do to inherit eternal life why do you call me good jesus answered no one is good except god alone you know the commandments you shall not murder you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. You know, sometimes this can be us. Hey, what do I have to do to get to the next step, God? And Jesus gives you the, well, you got to do this, you got to do this. 
I did, I, I did all that. That's easy. I did it already. And we get a, we get a little chip on our shoulder like, mm, I think I'm doing all right. And then in verse 21, Jesus brings it down a thing. Jesus looked at him and loved him. He says, one thing you lack. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible with God. It says, then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left their home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or field for me and for the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in the present age. Amen. You know, sometimes as brothers and sisters, we can fall into this trap that the rich young ruler fell into. And not to say that this man was even knowingly being wicked. That's the scary thing. This man thought he was good. He came up to Jesus. He, he got on his knees. He, he, he did all the right things. But then when Jesus confronted him with the one thing he needed to get up to receive his salvation, he looked at Jesus and he just said, I can't do it. You know, imagine missing salvation by just one thing. God, I'm willing to give you everything else. Just let me keep this one thing. Maybe it's impurity. God, I, I, I want to so badly, so badly. I just want to, I want to worship you, but I just can't stop being impure. I just want to be impure so bad. I refuse to give it up. Maybe it's your pride. You know what, God? I don't, I don't like the way that you require me to do this. How dare you? Maybe it's wealth. Maybe it's, I have too much, God. You ask too much of me. You ask for too much back, forgetting that their wealth came from him in the first place. Mm, right. You know, this one hits home. Maybe it's just a substance. Maybe it's drugs. You know, I remember for a long time, I used to, I used to smoke. I used to smoke weed. I, I would vape. I, I, I would smoke uh, those two things. I never smoked cigarettes, but I, I would vape a lot and I would, I would, I would smoke weed. And, I, and man, I, I just remember there'd be time after time that I'd be like, I'm not going to do that again. And then all of a sudden I would start doing it again, unconsciously. There's so many things that are just going to call you back. Remember all these good times we had together? It's interesting how sin does that. Remember you enjoyed this at one point. What do you mean you don't want to do that anymore? You know, that one thing you won't give up is stopping you from living out your life to the full. Yeah. It's just that one thing that you're like, I can't give this one thing up. That's the, that's the one thing that's just the wall between you and an unhindered relationship with God. And let's look at what God has in has in store for you. Let's see what God wants to give you. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 29. Come on, bro. 
Let's see what God wants to give us. You know, growing up, I don't think I ever really read this verse because I used to see it on girls' Instagram bios. And I was like, what can this verse teach me? And then I remember being in a, my, my, my Seeking God study and a brother's like, we're going to go to Jeremiah 29, 11. I was like, this one? But in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope in a future. But it's very funny. It usually stops there. Right. <laughs> and God's like, God's looking at you like, wait, 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 wait. What about verse 13? That one's an awesome verse too, right? But no one wants to put that up on social media. I'll give you verse 11. God's got a plan for me and it's going to prosper me and not harm me. It's going to give me hope in the future. But let me not tell you what I got to do first. Whoa. Well, I'm here to burst the bubble. Burst it. it says in verse 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart it's interesting that people don't want to give up everything but the reason why is because they don't want to invest their whole heart into it but it's not that hard to imagine why look at the world today People in almost every single relationship that they invest their whole heart into, they always get hurt. Always. Friendship, family relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, husband, wife, children, whatever, there's hurt. So why would I give my whole heart to this, per this, this person if I don't know what I'm going to get back. And it's so sad because people miss out on the joy of just knowing God. Yeah. But for us, we have to understand something as well. Is that if we're not careful, we can become those very people. God, I want the plan with no commitment. God is not Netflix. God is not Hulu. He does not give you a premium trial for free. So you can check it out, see what it's all about. And then if you want it, then you can buy it. God doesn't do that. God's like, no, you need to put a down payment down. Well, let's look at what that down payment is. He's a tough negotiator, that God. Luke 14. Verse 25, this... This section is called the cost okay. of being a disciple. Wow. So some people are like, how much is it going to cost? Well, let's find out. Yeah. Well, I said verse 25. I misspoke. We're going to pick up here in verse 31. It says, uh, or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up some things, give up the things that are easy. No, no, no. no. Talk to him, bro. Of course not. It says everything. You cannot be my disciple. And it's interesting. Because everything is such a simple word. Everything means everything. So if you're like, but what about this? But what about that? But what about that? Yep, that's it. If it's something you can think of, he wants it. But it's so interesting. Because God is, is the one ruler who doesn't want you to suffer. He doesn't want to take things away from you. Right. He just wants to know 
that you're going to put him above everything else. And I found in my life and the life of my, the people around me, the one thing that God will ask for is the one thing you refuse to give up. Whenever I would refuse to give up a relationship, God said, okay, give it to me. Whenever I would refuse to, to give up a job, because he was said, because his heart is this. If something is going to keep you from being close to him, he wants to destroy it. God crushes idols. So if you want all this stuff, that's great. Just keep it below God. And then God won't take it. Because God wants you unhindered to just be him and you, and you can love God with all of your heart. You know, family, I don't know about you guys, but I, I, I want to see this family grow up. Yeah. Yeah. And it can only grow if we're radical. It can only grow if we are committed to the fundamentals of discipleship. The vision is clear. In Matthew 28, God says he wants to see disciples of all nations. That is the vision that God has had for out. Since he left the earth, he said, I want everyone to be saved. I want everybody to come back home. And the only way that that's going to happen is if we accept these challenges. Challenge number one, be willing to go anywhere and talk about Jesus. Challenge number two. Be willing to do anything for Jesus. Amen. Challenge number three, be willing to give up everything for Jesus. And if we do these things, we will see the growth that we want to see, family. And to God be all the glory. Woo!